solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. I tell you, the recruiting command, especially at that level, because that's the pinnacle, that's the, the highest CSM position in the entire command. So at that time, I want to say we had 41 battalions. Each one of those had a, a lieutenant colonel and a command sergeant major assigned to it. We had at least seven brigades. Each one of those had a colonel and a CSM assigned. So a lot of senior ranking NCOs. And the recruiting command doesn't really have uh, junior non-commissioned officers. We don't have E1s to E3s. And we did have some corporal recruiters, but not too many. So generally, it's very NCO-centric, uh, E5s to, to E9s. And USREC is in perpetual motion. And it gets almost to where it's like a drug. You just get used to the pace. It's a very much a, what have you done for me lately business? And back then, one of the things that General Bostic mentioned to me during my interview was the toxic leadership environment in, in the recruiting command. And it was there. There was a lot of pressure. If you didn't make the mission, <clears throat> you, you heard about it at, at whatever level. And, and, and he and I, we wanted to change that. And, and you don't change like that, something like that overnight. It, it takes time. It's just like a, an aircraft carrier trying to do a U-turn. It takes a lot of ocean, a lot of time. And so that was one of our focal points. But, but a lot is a very stressful environment. It's not for everybody. It's very oh. fascinating. Like when you really think about it, recruiting in the military is really the closest thing that exists to like a revenue generating sales role outside of the military. You're the only, you're the only yeah. people that you're generating resources by going out and getting in the middle, everyone else, like you have a budget that the taxpayer just gives you. And that's really, those are your resources that you have to manage. But for recruiting, it's like go out, convince people to join the service, you have to sell people on that dream. And uh, that's it, tough. Uh, yes, so. it's, everything you said is spot on, almost too good. <laughs> and I say <laughs> that the word sales, because you're right. Yeah. You're basically, you're asking people to consider making probably what is up to that point in their life, the most important decision they've ever made in their life. Mm -hmm. And that is to, to decide to, to join the army or our, in our case, hopefully we hope it is, is the army. But I'm um, back then at the recruiting school, which I was stationed twice. It, we used to do sales training. Yeah, if you know, look up somebody called Lee Du Bois sales training, he mm -hmm. goes way back, but we eventually got away from that. Then we considered that it's more of a counseling session because sales just brings up certain perceptions and so negative uh, yeah, negative it things. is what it is yeah. uh, some people are, are good at it and, and some people aren't very good and they choose other means of doing the right thing i won't get into that too much but recruiters are only human and, and the army's made up of a microcosm of our society in our nation that's just the way it is <clears throat> but it is you are trying to find out what i i, I doubt they use that term in, this term anymore but back then what was a person's dominant buying motive? <laughs> was it training? Was it education? Was it service to country? Money for college? All these things. And you learn that by speaking to them and listening to them. And at the same time, telling them your army story. And hopefully that appeals to them. And obviously in recruiting, we heard the, the word no a lot. And back when I was recruiting as a field recruiter in Las Vegas, we, it was telephone or face to face. Uh, and a lot of, there wasn't any such thing as social media and so forth. But I tell you, recruiting right now is even more challenging because they're, because of the changes in our society, uh, whether it be politically, socially, educationally in our schools and now our colleges and universities, 
and I won't get into that, but I have some definite opinions on on on, this, on my about my beliefs and, and what certain things that are happening in our nation. But the recruiting market for any branch, uh, I'll tell you, Billy, if the Air Force is hurting for people, we're in bad shape because the Air Force is much smaller. They can be more selective in who they take, uh, such as very similar to the Marine Corps. But the Army's recruiting mission back when I was a command sergeant major of the recruiting command, the Army's recruiting mission was about 26% higher for any given fiscal year than all the other services combined. So that if the Army did well in any particular area, generally the other services did well also because the Army recruiting market really drives recruiting for the entire military. I, I remember, yeah, I, I remember a meeting at the Pentagon where General Bosick and I were attending with a bunch of high ranking people to include the Secretary of the Army, which is about as high as you can go other than the Vice President President. And he made a comment that he said, other than the war itself, he believed that the recruiting mission was the most important mission in the Army. And, and I think that the same could go now. We need to get good people, qualified people in our armed services, any branch. And it's not easy it's for a lot of reasons, a lot of which, all of which you probably are familiar with. You knew you were going to call it at your time at West Point. You knew that was going to be it. You talked to some people about when to end. Your, could you have kept going? You, was it 30, Is it's a 30 year I mean, ceiling? Yeah, you could, I could have kept going. I probably could have gotten another, well, I would say year at, at West Point because the superintendent has the option of selecting his own command sergeant major. Mm. So mine, and, and that's, that, that, that was the case here in my case, but mm. I can't remember when the superintendent that I served with left, because obviously I left before he did. And if another mm. one had come in, they do have the option of selecting someone else. And I could have put my hat in the ring through the Human Resources Command uh, for the Army of some other assignment out there for a command. Gotcha. Uh, <clears throat> okay. And so what advice did you get when you were talking to those people about deciding when to leave? A lot of advice I got was pray about it. I did take part in a... I did take part in a Bible study. I want to say it was Wednesday at lunchtime in one of the buildings there at West Point. And uh, we were very much involved as we were everywhere we went with our church, or in this case, we actually attended an on-post chapel on, uh, on West Point. And so I got a lot of, just go to the Lord with it, and eventually you're going to know what to do. I talked to my dad quite a bit. And he gave me some interesting advice based on his personal experience, which I think anyone that might watch this podcast could use. He was in a similar experience in 1967. He served 25 years in the Air Force, retired as the lieutenant colonel. He knew he was on the list for a promotion to colonel. He knew that. It was waiting for him. But he was struggling with... And he was very similar, had a job waiting for him in Birmingham, Alabama, in retirement home administration, which is what eventually became his post-military career. And his last year in the Army was over in Thailand during the Vietnam conflict. So we were stationed in Montgomery, Alabama, and he was overseas. And I didn't know this until he shared this story many years later, because I was only like in third or fourth grade back then. And I was like nine years old. But he said at a, at a certain point, some, I realized that the Lord was telling me, why do you consider this as being a situation where one position has to be somewhat negative and the other one has to be the right position? Why would you think I would necessarily put you in that position? Why couldn't it be a case of, Whichever decision you make is going to be the right decision. And I, I never forgot that. I always re remembered that. And uh, so I, I kept that in mind. That's probably what I drawled on 
dwelt on the most. That and again, focus on what is best for our kids. Because my daughter, Rosalie, at West Point was in her second high school already. She, took, she started high school at Fort Knox High School on post on Fort Knox, which you rarely see anymore. And then continued on at uh, West Point. And then Gert and I, we said, yeah, let's do this. And uh, so I, I think there's probably after I made decision a couple of weeks where I had my Marty Wells pity party. I really don't want to take out the uniform, but it was the right thing to do. What, when you were going through that identity battle as you were struck, like what kind of described to me what that was like for you emotionally, because you had, like you said, 26, you said 26 years of service. Yeah. 26 years, seven months. Exactly. Uh 26 and a half years. Because, um. Part of who you are, and it still is. I'll be honest with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, I would be remiss, Billy, if I didn't mention my Christian faith in all this. I think you should. And 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 uh, I I mentioned to you that I made some mistakes when I was in school at Auburn, and I was raised in a strong Methodist family, had a good family upbringing, but I didn't have that personal connection with my Lord and Savior. I I just didn't. I, I don't know why. But when I met my wife, when I met Gert, who had recently come to the Lord right before I called her, like two weeks before our first conversation, um, we, we all, the, the, we call it our God thing. That was my saving. I literally believe she's, she is God's saving grace personified for me. And we've built on that. Our our faith has always been uppermost in our marriage, in the way we, I say we, and I really, it really slants toward her, raised our kids. Because especially in Yushrek at those upper echelons, I was TDY a lot uh, and and, and missed a lot of events and so on and so forth. So I give her all the credit. We had a great church everywhere we went. And I think it has served us well and has served the kids well. Because they're all very well, as Jer- Jeremiah and Michaela uh, and Rosalie and, and Noah are very much involved with their churches and, and so forth, and their Christian walk and their relationship with the Lord. So that was really, that was a foundation, a buttress for, even though it may have been difficult in a practical sense, that I was taken off the Superman uniform, the Superman cape. And one thing I, I believe about being a Christian, I said, look, the Lord, I believe that God's word in, in, in some ways says, uh, the Lord never said it would be easy. He said it would be worth it. And my life's verse is James 1.12. And if I may recite that, it's, as <laughs> blessed is he who <clears throat> perseveres under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Basically, I paraphrase that as hang in there. It's going to be worth it in the long run. And so as as a fellow Christian, I know the Bible says, especially in Paul's writings, uh, it's not going to be easy. Look at what our Savior went through on the cross. And what I have experienced in life is nothing compared to what he has. So as the old saying, you got to pick yourself up by the bootstraps every now and then. Okay to feel sorry for yourself for a little bit. Now you just got to suck it up and drive on. I, I just always remember that and have tried. I remember it now and I can get into some, some of the things I'm doing now. I'm 65 years old and I don't see myself as being that age, which I don't mean that's to sound egotistical. I just don't. That's not. I don't have that mindset that a lot of people do once they reach a certain age. And I can give you several examples. I got a couple new hobbies, which is pretty cool. But back then, when it came time to take off the uniform, the reason I believe that I was doing it was the right reason. And I think God honored that. And so we came back here again to a place we were familiar with, a job I'd never done, but did have a lot of connections, still does, to the recruiting command so I could leverage my experience and expertise. 
uh, to the recruiting mission with the, uh, the Army Reserve ambassadors that I work with uh, in a lot of different ways and so forth. So that's where I got my peace of mind. It wasn't necessarily easy, but it was the right thing to do. And for anyone that's out there listening, there is life after the Army. There is life after the military. I don't care if you stayed in for two, three, or four years on initial enlistment and, and decided to, to get out and do other things, or if you retire. Uh, there's life, a lot of life to be lived uh, after you've served your country, if I could. For those that are getting out, especially for those that are retired and you've been in for 20 plus years, um, take what you've learned, take those values, take who you are and just really link in to your community. Mm. Your community needs you, whether it's serving at, in a nonprofit or training others in the job that's your second career, doing mm -hmm. whatever that is, what you learned in the military is always going to serve you well because it is part of yeah. you. You can't just because I said, take off the, I was just talking about a uniform and a figurative sense, but the values will never they'll always be part of who I am. I would say it, have a bucket list. You got to have a bucket list. And you could have a bucket list at 29 years old. There's no certain time to have a bucket list. As a matter of fact, I wish I had one earlier in life. But find out what you want to, to do. And, and maybe some people are retired from the military. Maybe they don't have to work. But there's always something. If you want to get involved in your community, there's always something you can do. And a couple, I'll do some of these kind of rapid fire and won't belabor them. But, and I said Gert would stare at me in a humorous way. She thinks that I might be one of those people that get involved in I spread myself too thin by doing too many things. So I'm trying to master that. But for 12 years, and I've been retired now. October will be, well, I, I will be in this job that I'm in now 14 years in October. And my retirement date is 1 January of, of 24. And that'll be 14 years as, as well. For 12 years, I was in Rotary International. If you're familiar with that, all about community service. Just to give you an idea, Rotary and the Gates Foundation have pretty much eradicated polio worldwide. So there's always something doing Rotary, Kiwanis, Veterans of Foreign Wars, these veteran service organizations or community service organizations. That's one way uh, I enjoyed that. I've taken really a leave of absence right now, but again, I did it for, for 12 years. I'm the chairman of a nonprofit called the Gateway to the Army Association, and for eight plus years, we've been raising money and planning and designing and building what we call Centennial Park on Fort Jackson in honor of its 100-year anniversary. We, we are just about ready to, we think, receive final word on our biggest grant, which is a little over $1.1 million, that we're hoping to hear from early October to finish that project. So that's another example. And I'm doing that with a group of other eight veterans and community service leaders. I'll be include, including a huge board of advisors. Hobbies. Last July of last year, I started scuba diving. You would love it. You got to go deep, man. I'm telling you. Scuba is, is, is one thing. I tell you, uh, uh, I've got a good friend of mine who's a retired Lieutenant Colonel Army, who's now a deputy sheriff with the with Richland County Sheriff's Office here in Columbia. And we've done everything together as far as scuba. So we've been in it, what, 13 months now? Yep. And just two weeks ago, we earned the rescue diver certification. So we've got 11 other certifications and so forth and more to follow. So what's next on our, we need about 25 more dives to become master scuba diver certified. That's a big milestone. And we're, and we're trying to get that before the end of this year, before the water gets too, too cold here in South Carolina, and we could travel to Gainesville, Florida to go to warmer waters to get some dives in. Uh, that's one. On Today is, what, 17 August? On the 19th, on Saturday, I take my first flying lesson. Congratulations. Living out your Air Force dream, yeah, finally. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I think I mentioned before, maybe I'm the son of an Air Force yep. pilot and the father of one, so I can't let that gap stay in. And this kind of dovetails into my next question, which is you're approaching a lot of these new things with a lot of confidence. And when you were still serving as a recruiter, you had, like you said, you felt like you almost were like 
Clark Kent changing in the phone booth when you had to reach out to people, cold call, talking to people. What, why do, what do you think people can do? I think that a lot of people tend to stay in places of comfort when there is uncertainty and fear and whether that's leaving the military, getting a new job, trying a new hobby, going diving or whatever it is. And you seem like someone who is unafraid to go try new things, but in your career, you also had to constantly put yourself in pretty uncomfortable situations, whether it's leadership or as just as a line recruiter, why do you think you were able to do that? And what advice would you give to people to build more confidence within themselves? Okay. Another excellent question. And, and I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to go back to uh, an answer or a reply that I've, I've, I've already stated or in some context, <clears throat> I, 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 I get, I give God all the credit. Because on, on certain, some of the things that, that I'm doing that I've put off for a long time, whether it's a hobby or actually I take my first course in, in the doctorate of ministry program in biblical studies at Liberty on this coming Monday. And again, I'm 65, but be quite honest with you, I don't care. And I'm going to go for a doctorate, and, but it just gets back to, I don't think I would do that. If it wasn't for my faith, if it wasn't grounded in someone, and I, and obviously as I'm reaching across my in something, meaning this, God's word, the Bible, I don't think I would have the confidence that I do now. I'm not cocky or anything. I'm just, hey, God's going to look out for me. I'm going to try this because I want to, and uh, and everything's going to be okay. Maybe. And I can't do everything. I've had to pull back, for instance, for my interest in martial arts, which I did with my sons for many years, and I started to get back into, but recently had to tell my my master instructor that I'm going to have to pull back because this doctorate degree is just going to be too demanding. I can't do that. So I, my wife was proud of me. She's, oh, so you actually pulled back on something. Uh, yeah, so, so I, I did do that. But I say, yeah, just... But the, especially for retiring from the military, you've already got what it takes. You've had experience, whether it be a leadership, whether it be some good, some bad, some things that success and dealing with not successful missions or whatever the case may be. You've had to overcome failure just like I have, and you've been endeared with success. So, but to me, I attribute it to my Christian faith. And it doesn't mean it's easy street. Because it, it it will take a lot of money, a, a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of effort, and and some money too. I'll be honest with you. Uh, but but the, to, to me, I just consider it an investment. <laughs> some people may ask them, Marty, what, why are you doing all this? Especially if it might. For years, I put off the education at the doctorate level <clears throat> because I couldn't answer the question to myself. Well, what are you going to do with this if you are successful? And I finally just said, you know what. I'm going to let God handle that. He, he'll let me know. And uh, somehow, despite my, <laughs> my scholastic record at Auburn, which I already embarrassingly shared with you, I got a, a master's while I was in the Army, did much better, took several graduate courses at Liberty to get some biblical studies background, six of them over the last year and a half. Really enjoyed it. And just looking forward to the next uh, opportunity, the next challenge. And I don't know what I'm going to do with it. Hey, everybody. I really hope that you liked this supercut of the post-military podcast. If you did and you want to see more, I would recommend that you check out the whole episode, which is here on YouTube and also on multiple different podcasting platforms. If you like this and you want to support the channel, I would ask that you give the video a like, subscribe, and uh, share the content with those who might need to hear it. Thanks so much, guys, and we'll see you in the next episode. Peace. <laughs>